First story. I begged my daughter to reconcile for one straight year, after my ex-wife divorced me for cheating on her. But she took her mom's side and cut ties with me. Now, after 17 years, my daughter has contacted me, begging to reconcile for her daughter, so I refused. Now she will know the pain she caused. I am not sure if I am in awe. I am going to provide some background. I am in my 60s now. I was married to my ex-wife, and we had a daughter. Our marriage was going through its ups and downs, but I was really close with our daughter. But as our marriage was going through its difficulties, I made a huge mistake that I still regret to this day. I started having an affair with my coworker. She was in a violent, physically abusive relationship at home. We became friends at work, and things just escalated from there. She got an out from me. She got the support she needed to file for divorce from her husband, who is currently in jail. The affair went nowhere, and we called it off shortly after. But I was glad that she got out of her abusive relationship, and that she was safe. But when my ex-wife found out about the affair, things didn't go as expected. She lashed out and said a lot of horrible things about me to our daughter, who was 15 at the time. I admitted full fault for the affair, but even after the divorce, I sensed that the distance between me and my daughter was growing. Until one day my daughter said she wasn't going to speak with me anymore, and she was going to cut me off from her life forever. That was the most painful thing anyone had ever said to me. I begged her to please reconsider. I still remember that day. But time passed. My daughter kept her word, and after trying to connect with her for the first year, I gave up. I found out from one of my mutual friends that my ex-wife married a great guy. I was happy because I was hoping that would remove the hatred from my ex-wife, and that my ex-wife would advise our daughter to at least rekindle a relationship with me. But that never happened. I moved states a year later. I am at peace now, but I still have some aching sadness. I have retired. Both my parents have passed away. My brother passed away tragically a couple of years ago. To be honest, I am waiting for my turn. I have only my dog and my sister left. A couple of hours ago, my daughter called me on my phone. I haven't spoken to her in 17 years. I instantly recognized her voice, but I didn't feel anything. No happiness, no sadness, just indifference. She was crying a lot on the call, and we caught up on life. She's married, and she has a daughter who's now 12. She apologized for cutting off contact and she says her mom asked her to reconnect with me, as her mom felt guilty about how everything played out. She said, she really wanted me to meet her daughter, and her daughter was constantly asking about granddaddy. But I wasn't feeling anything. After we caught up on everything in our lives, I told her I didn't care about her or her daughter, and to never contact me again. I then hung up. Was I the, uh, comments tear OP a new one. F spouse 123. Y T uh. I hate when adults make very bad adult decisions that affect their children, and then blame the children when they respond in a very childlike manner. Your daughter was a teenager. That is a rough time for kids, even when their home life is stable. You gave her one whole year before you cut bait and gave up on her. Then you moved away. You told your daughter that she wasn't important enough to fight for, and she believed you. Now that she is an adult with a child of her own, she has reached out to you, and you again told her she wasn't important to you. She now knows she was probably right to cut you out the first time. Captain K of Mayan. She has reached out to you, and you again told her she wasn't important to you. It sounds like he's been waiting 17 years to hurt her back, and he finally got his wish. Congrats on his small, pathetic victory. He's totally YTA. Maimed in he's 974. Ain't nothing like a deadbeat narcissist claiming to be the only victim in a situation he created for himself. I had helped my cowboy get out of an abusive marriage. Whale 3 RD. I helped a coworker out of an abusive marriage and didn't even have to sleep with her. Shocking. Topple Petation 14681. Well, it's already been said, but you're the arsehole. OP, okay. Punania. You don't have to be one, though. A lot of time has passed. At least try to meet her halfway. Surely you owe her that much. Dystopian Glitter. I'm confused as to how this is even a question for the OP. But I guess he doesn't care about anything and is just waiting to die. Alone. How tragic. Judgment YTA. Update. One day later. Look, I was extremely drunk last night. The words that came out of my mouth weren't the best, and my comments on my post weren't great either. Seeing how everyone said I was the ah, I decided to call my daughter again an hour ago. I didn't really expect her to pick up the call, but she did immediately. I apologized for last night, and she said there was no need to apologize. 
I then sent her a link to this Reddit post on messages and told her I knew I was the ah, and thousands said so. She again said I wasn't the ah. She started crying again. I told her she's free to come to my house anytime in the next four months, because after that, I will be leaving the country with my sister and our dog. Our parents left us a nice farmhouse in their home country, and we will be spending the rest of our lives there. I sent her my address and messages, and my daughter said she'd come with her husband and her daughter by the end of next week. She asked if she was welcome to stay there for multiple days, and I told her she could stay for however long she wanted, as our house was spacious enough. Comments. The Doctor 49. I just saw the update, and good SHT, man. I hope things work out for you, and don't be hard on yourself. Life happens, and sometimes things are out of our control, but I'm super glad you and your daughter have rekindled your relationship, and I hope it all turns out great for you. Maybe you're not an arsy hole after all. Life's hard sometimes, and we all make emotional choices sometimes. Be well, OP. Second story. My entitled sister cheated on my fiancé, married him, and now, after five years of NC, she has returned with bruises, claiming her husband is abusing her, then demands that I solve her issues blaming me for not fighting enough for my relationship with my ex and accusing me of ruining her life and causing her to be disowned by our whole family. Five years ago, my older sister, Jane, slept with my ex-fiancé, John. It was one of those, I've loved him for years situations for Jane, or so she claimed back then, so she took her shot to get with him, even as the mistress he hides away. And John, well, he was pissed back then because I didn't fight for our relationship. Suffice to say that when I found out they were screwing around, I mentally thought, wow, these people are pathetic. I had no intentions of fighting, arguing, or begging. I never even cried now that I think about it. Even back then, I was a one-and-done kind of person. I cut my mother off for cheating on my dad, and I cut off friends who cheated on their partners, even when we were stupid kids. Cheating isn't a mistake. It pisses me off thinking about it. Jane was crying and telling me, you have to understand like I hadn't caught her screwing my fiancé in my bed in my condo. Or John yelling at me, saying, If you ever loved me, you'd fight for me, cry for me, or do something. And then the most hilarious line. Maybe if you put out more, I wouldn't have strayed. And seriously, I was always the one initiating, even before our engagement. And I had stopped bothering because he claimed his SX drive was lower than mine. I know for a fact that I'm a good lay. He just never wanted to put any effort in. And even if I hadn't been trying to have as ex regularly, that is not an excuse to cheat. I tossed them out, packed up my crap, cancelled everything but the honeymoon, and got refunds. I sent John's family their 25% contribution and security footage of John screwing my sister in the living room. It went back to the day he moved in, and the idiot probably forgot I had security cameras inside. And that was beyond petty, but despite how much his family loved me, I also knew that his doting father and grandmother would never believe John was capable of cheating on me without some kind of proof. I didn't need them harassing my family like they did others for lying about their family. I had also evicted John and then had an agent sell my condo while I turned my would-be honeymoon into a solo. Thank F, I'm free trip. And when I came back, I moved. Again, one and done kinds of girls cheaters, liars, betrayers, and perverse jerks do not deserve forgiveness or second chances. I learned that from my parents' situation. You give them a second chance. They'll do it over and over again, then scream. You said you forgave me, and, I can't help it. It meant nothing, while victimizing themselves. It took my dad years to stop forgiving my mother. But I will never make that mistake. In five years, Jane and John got married because she was pregnant, moved into her apartment together, and now have three children 4M, 3M, and newborn F. They have no friends and no familial support beyond my mother. My dad is apparently involved with his grandson, but does not help financially. Nor does he babysit or even let John into his house. I was visiting my dad when Jane showed up at his house in the middle of the night. She had her children with her, had a black eye, marks on her neck, and bruises on her arm. And initially, I was worried as my dad brought them all in. That worry disappeared the moment she said John got angry at her, because I'm not OP. She was blubbering about all the things John expected of her, and how he essentially wanted her to be me. Little Miss Perfect, even though I'm the one that doesn't want him. Dad tried to stop her multiple times, but I told her to keep going. Her tirade was how it should have been. He hated and hit, not her. John lost his family because of me. They only have our mother as help because of me. I didn't love him enough to fight or be with him, no matter the circumstances, like she did, that everything falling apart was on me, not her, and that she was sick of how I ran away, 
and yet still managed to ruin her relationship with John. Even her wedding was all about how OP would have wanted this. And intimacy always ends with his ex with OP was better. You need to try harder. And apparently, in Jane's eyes, John beating her, for the first time, was entirely on me. Want to know why? Because her children look like our mother instead of me, who looks like my father. Even her children are treated like afterthoughts by John because he had hoped they'd get good genes. They only had another child because he wanted one to look like me, and that one doesn't either. And then, she said that maybe if I talked to John, things would get better for her. After all that, Dad pretty much told her that her kids would be staying with him, but she was on her own. Go to the police or your mother. Then she turns to me, begging me to convince him otherwise, like, is she serious? You're in a situation of your own making. You're older than me, decided to screw a taken man, and then married him even after you claimed. All he wanted was the woman that abandoned him. You're the one who was cut off from any viable support system for being an awful person. No one deserves to be abused, and I don't view it as karma. But Jane stopped being my sister, the first time she slept with John. Someone who loves you would never show such blatant hatred for you. That goes for both of them. Comments Lazuli underscore Rose Isn't it funny how once they get the dude, get married, and have kids, it all falls apart. A relationship that starts as an affair is never truly healthy. They might stay together, but it is rarely a soulmate situation. BTW, if John was so into you, why didn't he fight for the relationship? OP. By his standards, at least back then, begging and arguing are how you fight for a relationship. He spent about three months doing and saying whatever to anyone dumb enough to listen, trying to get messages to me. And honestly, he got a lot of people cut off from me in the process, so beyond that. The best way to keep a relationship is to not screw your partner over or just break up with them. At least you can be cordial afterwards. Musernamisme. I'm sorry she was beaten. No one deserves that at the hands of their spouse, but. Ha 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 ha. What a pair of pathetic DCK heads they are. You definitely dodged a bullet, because, let's face it, if you had married him, you would have been the abuse victim right now. I don't know what the F your sister was thinking, but she must have a single digit IQ if she expects you to help her. Her husband is a narcissist through and through. She can do whatever she wants with that. OP. Yeah, it's an awful situation for her. But she seriously screwed herself over. I definitely dodged a bullet, cutting him off. Third story. I asked my wife to never have kids. She agreed and secretly had an abortion. Even though she loves being a mother and wanted children. So I left her. Now she is begging to reconcile. And I don't know if I can ever forgive her. I have been happily married to my wife, Clara for around three years now. I love this woman to pieces. I don't want to get sentimental, but she truly is my other half, and I cannot see myself with another woman, even now. Before we got married, I made my stance on children clear. I didn't want any. She agreed in the moment, and I thought that was that. About a year and a half into our marriage, she brings up the question of children again. She asks me if I want kids, and I say no, I don't. She hums, and we go back to doing what we did before. It wasn't a conversation so much as it was an odd question, this time around, but I didn't think anything of it. We had a very robust sexual life, but always took the necessary precautions. She has the implant, and I use a condom around 90% of the time, so I wasn't worried. Her bookshelf recently broke, so I ordered a new one. I had wanted to build it as a surprise and put her books on it for when she came home. While going through them, I noticed an old journal of hers. I immediately smiled and flipped through it. When we were in college, she'd carry it around. It was a future planning notebook of sorts. If she wanted something in life, she'd draw out exactly what she envisioned, add clip-ins, and do the whole nine yards. Manifestation, if you will. She had shown me it in college, after declaring that she wanted to pursue her doctorate. And I remember being stunned at the attention to detail. I mean, we were only sophomores, and she knew exactly what she wanted to do, what she wanted to study, and where she would take herself. It made me feel out of depth. I liked it. Anyway, I flipped through the journal, reminiscing about the past. I hadn't expected there to be any new entries at least, not anything recent that I hadn't experienced with her. But as I opened it up, I saw something I never thought I'd see. It was a section dedicated to pregnancy and baby prep. She had researched prenatal vitamins, objins in our area, had images of cradles, etc. It was only two pages, but I remember feeling so sick. In my head, there was only one reason she'd put that in a journal like this. She wanted kids. Naturally, I was torn up. I kept telling myself I had been upfront about what I wanted, 
and if she hadn't, that was her fault. But the thought that she'd secretly been suffering because of me, that she was holding herself back from the life, she wanted to please me, I couldn't stand it. I confronted her about it as soon as we came home, and I found out the situation was a lot worse than I thought. Clara did indeed want kids, but claimed she wanted our relationship more, and was okay with compromise. I asked her a million times if she was sure. I really wanted her to be honest, and not feel like she had to hold anything back. She insisted that not having children wasn't a deal breaker for her, but I kept pushing. I couldn't understand why she'd put something that wasn't that important to her in that journal. In the midst of our conversation, she dropped the bomb. She told me she had an abortion a year and a half ago. I offered up the information, and I should have been relieved. It was like the proof she needed to convince me that she meant what she said about children not being deal breakers. I can't describe what I felt in that moment. What I'm still feeling. What I can say is that I have never blown up at my wife the way I did that night. I didn't put my hands on her. I would never put my hands on her. But it was not a pretty exchange. I just remember feeling hurt that she hadn't consulted me on such an important decision. She went and had such a life-altering procedure without discussing it with me. I didn't even effing notice that it happened. I mean, those things have side effects, right? She would have been bedridden for days afterwards, in physical and emotional pain. How could I not have seen the signs? I'm still beating myself up about it. I remember her asking me if I wanted kids, but nothing about her emotional state for the rest of that week, when she would have had the procedure done. How much can I really claim to care about her? I don't want children, and I still don't. But I'd rather chew my left arm off than make her have an abortion. Even more so now that she's told me she isn't really against having kids the way I am. I'd happily raise a kid if it meant she didn't need to go through something so drastic. I've been staying with my sister for the last week and a half. I needed space to think, so I left. I want to see her and ask if she's okay. But I don't know what to do or say. I'm still unbelievably angry at her and at myself. I don't want to yell at her again. I think the first time around scared her pretty badly. And I don't want to repeat that. My sister thinks I'm being petty by punishing my wife for something I would have agreed with regardless. But I wouldn't have effing agreed. I don't know. Ada. Relevant comments. OP on not considering prioritizing his wife's preferences when she is prioritizing his decisions. Comment 1. OP. To clarify, I never once said this. If that's how my post came across, let me clear it up. If she came to me and asked me to start trying for a kid in other words, to go off birth control, and stop using condoms my answer would be no. I've always been firm about that. She's never pushed the issue, but no amount of begging would entice me to plan to have a child. Having an unplanned child, on the other hand, wasn't something we discussed. Obviously, hindsight is 20 20th but that doesn't help much here. Update. I woke up to a lot of comments and outright hate, so I thought I'd clear a few things up. A lot of you were concerned about me snooping in Clara's journal. I met this woman when I was six years old, we had experienced over half of what she had written down in that notebook together. She's been letting me read her entries routinely since college, though I would read them more often back then. Like I said, I found her decisiveness to be incredibly attractive. But college was six, seven years ago, and times change. I'm not sure if she has other journals, but her use of this specific one died down as we got older, and so did my readership. I felt no qualms about picking it up and reading it that day because, quite frankly, I never have. This was not the first time I read that journal without her presence, as I've been given express permission to do so. It was meant to be a quick trip down memory lane. I had no idea she had added more things, let alone pregnancy planning. She keeps all her old journals, sketchbooks, etc. In the same area. And this book was in that pile. You should have gotten a vasectomy. I'm not discussing my reasons for not wanting kids here, but I did discuss them thoroughly with Clara before we got married. Our reasons for not wanting children were very similar based on that initial conversation, but I guess hers wavered as time went on. How that turned me into an evil dictator who refused to hear her opinions out, I'll never understand, but I guess that's Reddit for you. I didn't get a vasectomy because I am not sure that I won't want kids 10-15 years down the line. I am positive, I don't want them at the current moment, but I'm 27. Opinions and circumstances change. Regardless of its reversibility, it's marketed as a permanent surgery. Vasectomies are covered by my health insurance, but reversals are not. It simply made no sense to invest in something I wasn't sure could be undone if I didn't want it anymore. Not when Clara and I were taking the necessary precautions to avoid pregnancy otherwise. She got on birth control way before we started having SX, and I had absolutely nothing to do with that decision. As far as I know, 
she's quite happy with it. The chances of pregnancy with the implant are less than 1%, even less when using condoms as well. We talked about the decision together and ultimately decided a vasectomy wasn't the right choice. Someone actually went as far as to say that because I didn't get my vas deferens cinched, an unexpected pregnancy was inevitable. A 0.5% chance and the inevitable are two vastly different things. You guys do realize that vasectomies aren't 100% effective either, right? Unless you're pushing for abstinence. I really don't want to hear it. We also don't go raw unless we both agree to it, which I would never pressure her to do. You verbally abused her. Clara and I both grew up in SHTTY homes. Our parents yelled and were extremely combative. After growing up in that environment, we agreed to avoid that kind of behavior in our relationship, and we do our best to keep to that. I have never raised my voice at her before this argument. I'm more on the timid side, so I imagine it was a shock for her to see me so angry. She also just doesn't do well with yelling in general. It wasn't my words, so much as it was my tone, should I have raised my voice? No. But I'm not an infallible robot. My comment about not putting my hands on her was to draw conclusions away from physical violence. Clearly, it wasn't taken that way, and it had the opposite effect. The exchange was heated on both sides, and lots of things were said. It was the worst disagreement we have ever had, and we have been together for close to a decade, becoming close friends for even longer. That being said, I still think it was on the tamer side of the overall spectrum, relative to other people. That spectrum might be a bit skewed due to my childhood. But take that as you will. You're a DCK for leaving her for a week and a half. To be fully clear, this was a mutually respected decision. I told her I needed space to think, and she suggested I take it outside the house. Granted, she wasn't the happiest when she said it, but we had just finished a heated argument. We texted the entire time I was at my sister's place. Very dull and mundane conversation, mostly pleasantries, but I didn't just abandon her. We weren't speaking loudly, but we weren't in contact. I don't know how else to phrase that. Things were just tense and very different from our usual level of interaction. Everything was surface level. We would check to make sure the other person ate, showered, or whatever else. But that was it. There was no continuation of our discussion while we were apart. We were both taking the time to make sure we were in the right headspace to have a proper conversation, as is common for our relationship. It just took me a bit longer to get there. She wouldn't have been bedridden. Abortions aren't that deep. I'll concede to the physical aspect of this. I've often heard them described as a bad period, and a lot of the women in my life tend to tap out during their monthlies, which is what I based my assumption on. I accept that it was incorrect. Though I'm not sure if I should, because half of you agreed with my take on the post, condemning me for not noticing, and the other half told me I was overreacting. Again, I guess that's Reddit for you. More importantly, I will not agree on the general take on the emotional aspect. At the time, I still did not believe Clara genuinely wanted to have an abortion after hearing her updated stance on having kids. I imagined her feelings would be on par with those of someone who experienced a miscarriage rather than an abortion because of this. I still do. The only thing that would change my mind at this point is Clara herself. You should go to couples counseling and seek therapy individually. We are both in different types of talk therapy and have been for several years. I'm not sure how helpful a couple's therapy would be on top of that but I'm not opposed to it. Asking if you wanted kids was consult enough. She doesn't owe you anything. Reading through the comments, many of you thought this, and were simply going to have to disagree. As the father of the child, the decision to abort should not have been made without my clear and explicit knowledge that she was pregnant. We weren't separated at the time, nor did I cheat, and contrary to popular belief, I'm not abusive. I deserve to know. I won't apologize for expecting my wife to consult me on family planning decisions. I'd do the same for her ten times over if roles were reversed. Call it controlling. I really don't care. Asking if I want kids is a completely different discussion than terminating a pregnancy. I am on my way home now and will update if the situation changes, likely sometime this week. I'd ask for well wishes, but I think it's clear none of you are rooting in my favor. Effing hell. Final update. I came home the morning following my initial post, and Clara and I had a very long conversation. We both apologized for letting the previous conversation get out of hand and acting out of character. I also explained why I left in the first place and apologized for raising my voice. She's especially sensitive to that kind of thing, so I addressed it first. She forgave me and said that as long as we could keep things calm this time around, it would be okay. She was more interested in finding out what I was so deeply thinking about that I had been gone for so long. Again, we do take breaks from conflicts from time to time, 
and revisit them when we're calmer. Though this was the first one where I physically removed myself from her proximity. I told her how I initially felt after reading her journal entry. I hadn't been mad then. Part of me was confused we had agreed on no kids before getting married after all. The other half was riddled with anxiety. Contrary to what you may all think, I adore Clara. She is, quite honestly, one of the only good things this life has given me. I didn't want to lose her, but if she wanted kids badly enough to put them in her journal, I wasn't sure what that would mean for us. She downplayed the importance of the entry. In her view, not everything she puts in the journal is something she's genuinely hoping for. Some things are just nice to fantasize about, and not every fantasy is meant to be reality. I was honest. I told her that her words were hard to believe, given how meticulously she had written everything down and planned it out. The last thing I wanted was for her to harbor resentment over what her life could have been. She assured me that wasn't the case, but I'm still unsure. Talking about the abortion itself was hard on both of us. I wanted to know if she was in pain and what signs I had missed. I didn't really press for details on the procedure, but we talked a lot about how she felt afterwards, why she hid it, and how she came to her decision. I just held her in my arms and listened for the most part. It was gut-wrenching, to say the least. It turns out that the second time she asked if I wanted kids occurred a month or two after she had already had the procedure done. She had asked because she was contemplating whether or not to tell me about it. I guess she had ultimately decided not to. She told me I was actually with her the day she took the pills. I remembered the day because she had been crying, and I wasn't sure why. When I asked, she cited cramps, so I got her a heating pad and laid down with her. Her periods have always been pretty hard on her, so I guess I didn't think much of it. In hindsight, I should have realized something was up because she hasn't had bad cramps in years. Still, I'm glad she didn't go through it completely alone. Much later that day, I asked her why she didn't come to me when she realized she was pregnant. In her eyes, she was protecting our relationship. She knows our circumstances, my reasons for not wanting kids, and my stance on abortion. She didn't want to burden me with having to choose between the two, and so she made the choice herself. As hard as I try, I can't understand or accept her reasoning. Her decision to go through this alone, while meant to shield me, inadvertently communicated that she doesn't trust me to support her or handle the truth. All I understood was that she feels like she can't lean on me when she's in trouble. And if that's the case, I'm not sure why we're married. She's always been independent. But this is the first time I felt completely blindsided by not being included. I asked up and down if I had given her a reason to doubt me, to doubt my commitment to her if she felt I wasn't a reliable partner, etc. She said no, but that just makes all this harder to grasp. She said she was afraid saying anything would change how I viewed her or our relationship, but I'm having a hard time distinguishing insecurity or anxiety from reasonable doubt. I asked her if she knew I loved her, how much I cared for her, the lengths I would go to make her happy, etc. She laughed a little and reminded me of a line from my wedding vows. We shared private vows before our ceremony, and I had said quite a bit. I was a little shocked that she remembered that portion at all, let alone word for word. We transitioned to talking about the promises we made to one another, and the moments in our relationship where we had complete trust and faith in one another. It helped put us both in better moods and ended the night on a lighter note for both of us. We're doing okay at the moment. Not quite where we were before, but getting there. Everything's still incredibly raw including our eyes. We both broke down five minutes into the conversation. Clara is against couples counseling right now I'm ambivalent, as we're still working a couple of things out on our own. I'm not sure how helpful a third party asking what steps we're willing to take to improve trust and transparency will really be, but I'm open to anything at this point. We're not leaving one another. Issues or not, we both think it's clear that there's still an abundance of love between us, and we don't want to throw that away. Some of you will be happy to know that Clara and I decided on a new rule for ourselves. Clara was a lot more upset about my leaving than she initially let on. From now on, the distance between the top and bottom floors of our home is all the space either of us are allowed to take. We need to cool our heads. If proximity really does become an issue, the maximum time either of us is allowed to stay outside the house is 48 hours. So no more week-long stays at my sister's. And that's it. Thank you for watching the video. If you are interested in listening to these kinds of stories, we've got more in store for you. Simply subscribe to our channel, hit the like button, and share it with your friends.